Ya Rabbi laka alhamdu hatta tarda Wa laka alhamdu idha ma ratit Wa laka alhamdu ba'da al-ridai Wa laka alhamdu abadan abadan abada Wa alhamdulillah Alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitaba Wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja Wa alhamdulillah Alladhi lam yattakhith waladan Wa lam yakun lahu sharikun fil mulk ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وأطيع الله والرسول لعلكم ترحمون وسارعوا إلى مغفرة من ربكم وجنة عرضها السماوات والأرض أعدت للمتقين اللهم اجعلنا من المتقين واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله أمين يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله تعالى in today's brief khutbah I'd like to share with you a reminder a reminder from a passage that belongs to surah Ali Imran the third surah of the Quran first and foremost just something very basic that all of us already know. Allah Azza wa Jal invites us to the Friday prayer. The commandment occurs in Surah Al Jum'ah. And He says to us that when the call is made, Fas'aw ila dhikrillah. Rush to the remembrance of Allah. So instead of calling it the khutbah or calling it the prayer, He called it the remembrance of Allah. The essence of the khutbah is what? To remind ourselves of Allah. It is a means of refreshing our commitment. It's a means of refreshing an individual, at the same time refreshing an entire community. And the best means to do that is the remembrance of Allah. And speaking of remembrance, there are different kinds of remembrance of Allah. But the best of them, the ultimate remembrance of Allah, is what Allah Himself calls the ultimate reminder, the Qur'an. وَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ Remind with the Qur'an. كَلَّا إِنَّهَا تَذْكِرَ No, on the contrary, this no doubt is certainly a powerful means of reminder. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ وَقُرْآنٌ مُبِينٌ It is nothing but a reminder. So one of the essential roles that the Qur'an plays in the life of a believer, besides, despite its knowledge, and there's a wealth, an infinite wealth of knowledge in the Qur'an, one of its central roles that it plays in the life of a Muslim, and in the life of a community, is that the Qur'an is a reminder. And by definition, a reminder is something you already know. A reminder is not new information. If I remind you, you have a flight at 7 o'clock, it's something you knew but you forgot. So Allah Azza wa reminds us in the Qur'an, and this lends to an appreciation of why there is so much repetition in the book of Allah. Allah Azza wa says the same thing many times. Many, many times He mentions taqwa for example. Many, many, many times. And the proportion to which something is mentioned more, it illustrates how quickly people forget that which is mentioned more. So if Allah Azza wa Jal mentions over 200 times, He mentions taqwa, it is because even if you know about taqwa, you forget to apply it. You forget to think about it. You forget to realize it when the time comes. So you need to be reminded over and over again, as do I. So a reminder from Surah Ali Imran, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Obey Allah and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So that you may be shown mercy. So that all of you may be shown mercy. In this ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal has attributed obedience to Allah and His Messenger with 
the one who is hopeful of getting Allah's mercy. Ulaika yarjuna rahmatullah. Those are the ones who are hopeful for the mercy of Allah. So anyone hoping for Allah to show mercy on them need to first change their attitude about obedience to Allah and the Messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no mercy outside of obeying Allah and His Messenger. So that you may be shown mercy, be in obedience to Allah. And by the way, a couple of ayat before, there's a, there's a prohibition. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la ta'kulu riba Adha'afa mudha'afa A couple of ayat before. Allah says, those of you who believe, don't consume riba. Don't consume all forms of this detestable form of earning. The most common occurrence of which is interest. It's not limited to interest, but at least that's the most common form. Don't be consumers of it, even if it multiplies one on top of itself. And by saying adha'afa mudha'afa, Allah illustrates something. That why would people get involved in riba anyway? What's the incentive? So you get something out of it. You work, you work so hard to earn this money, and the banker comes to you and says, let it work for you now. Let it multiply on top of itself. So you want to do it, so you succeed. So you get the most out of your efforts. Allah Azza wa gives an alternative in the same ayah. لَا تَأْكُلُ الْرِبَا أَضْعَافَ مُضَاعَفَ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Instead of consuming riba, I give you an alternative. The alternative is be conscious of Allah. Now what do you, you say? An alternative? I was thinking maybe give me an alternative form of investment. Somewhere else I should put my money. Allah Azza wa Jal offers the incentive. The alternative, have taqwa of Allah. And then he adds, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So that you, and literally, aflaha iflah is to see the fruits of your labor. So that you may see the fruits of your labor, have taqwa of Allah. The very reason for which one would get involved in riba is to get something out of it. And Allah says, you want to get something out of it? You want to succeed? You want to see your investments come through? I'll give you an alternative. It's taqwa of Allah. And if that's not enough, وَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ أَلَّتِي أُعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ The very next ayah now. Fear that if you're not being going to be careful and cautious of Allah, then here's another incentive why you should get rid of riba out of your life. Fear the fire. Be cautious, be, be aware of the fire. That has been prepared. أُعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ It has been prepared for disbelievers. Just by saying that, that's a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has not been prepared for Muslims. It has not been prepared for believers. The ayat began, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ amanu. Those of you who believe, you shouldn't consume riba. You should have taqwa of Allah. You should have taqwa of the fire. So, and that fire which has not been prepared for you, but prepared for al-kafireen. So Allah Azza wa Jalla is reminding us, don't act like those who are headed for the hellfire. Just by saying that, he could have just said, just fear the fire and that's enough. But he added those, that it's prepared for those who disbelieve. May Allah not make us from them. And then he says, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ Fine, we're afraid of the fire, but he gives us an additional incentive. We don't just want to be escaped, we don't just want to escape the fire, we want to be entered into Allah's paradise subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the mercy of Allah. So he says, he gives us the other incentive, obey Allah and the Messenger, so that you may be shown mercy. I gave you this introduction because the real passage that I want to share with you is what's coming next in the ayat. It's a very unique place in the Qur'an. And in this place, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions a certain category of people. There's certain attributes, certain personality traits that these people have. And these traits are so important and so powerful that Allah mentions the beginning of it is the mention of Jannah. And in the end of this passage, there's the mention of Jannah again. And in between there are these people. So the mention of these people is sandwiched between the mention of Jannah. The beginning of it is Jannah and the end of it is Jannah. SubhanAllah, who are these people? We want to be from these people. We want to at least embody some of these characteristics so we are hopeful for Allah's Jannah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ the, the, the choice of words is just incredible. Run, run towards forgiveness from your Lord. And this is an alternative because just the ayat before are talking about people that are running towards worldly benefit. They're running in the opposite direction. Allah is giving you something else to run towards. The first thing, forgiveness from your Lord. Run towards forgiveness from your Lord. What that implies for you and I, is first of all, you don't run towards something that you don't need. You and I, we never run towards something that we don't need. You rush to work because you need to get there on time. You rush, you hit the books because you need to pass the exam. We rush to things when we need them. So first of all, we need to acknowledge that we are in need of Allah's forgiveness. 
And who will realize that they need to be forgiven by Allah except the one who realized they've done something wrong? The first thing the believer has to internalize, no matter if we are good Muslims, we are not free of sin. We are not free of disappointing the, the standards Allah has set for us. After all, it is Allah who says about all of humanity, including the Muslims, مَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ They didn't appreciate Allah like He deserved to be appreciated. The first thing He tells us, run towards forgiveness from your Lord. سَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And the second incentive, run towards these, this garden, this Jannah, whose expanse, whose real estate, whose size is comparable to the heavens and the earth combined. You know, this hits home when you get a little older. When you're younger, you're not gonna understand and appreciate the power of these words. But those of you that are older, those of you that are married, those of you that have kids, you will appreciate this. When you're younger, you don't care about money, not so much. So long as you have clothes on your back, whatever, it's all good. You can live in an apartment, you can roommate with five other guys, it's all good, no problem. When you get married, you say, I need to move out to a house. I can't be in that apartment anymore, I, we need to buy a property. And it should be in a good neighborhood. And if this one's not the right size, we need something a little bigger. And the kids are growing older, we need something with more bedrooms. What about a backyard? What about this? What about that? We run towards a house. We run towards permanent residence. We don't want to stay in temporary housing. We want to stay in permanent residence. It's a status of, of stability. So Allah Azza wa Jal offers us stability. Run towards this garden. This amazing real estate. Which the square footage is huge. It's the expanse of the heavens and the earth. And who has this been prepared for? Uiddat lil muttaqeen. These are the people. It has been prepared for those who are truly cautious, afraid, careful. These are the muttaqeen. Who are these muttaqeen? Allah Azza wa speaks about the people of taqwa all the time. But in this passage, there are some specific attributes that I want us to try and remember and implement, inshaAllah ta'ala. What good are these reminders if they don't affect our life? الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ This is the first attribute of the people of taqwa, he says. Those who spend in ease, in times that are easy, and in times that are difficult. Of course here, spending implies spending for the sake of Allah. Investing in that real estate that you get later on. You don't get any pictures of that real estate yet. There are no brochures, there's only trust. You have to trust the one selling it to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any other salesman tries to sell you something without showing you the product, you say, I don't trust you, man. But Allah Azza wa Jalla is selling us. Hal adullukum ala tijara? Should I tell you of a sale? Fastabshiru bi bay'ikum. Congratulations on its trade agreement that you've made. Allah is selling us something, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why would Allah Azza wa Jalla need to sell us something? It's not like we need, Allah, you know, when you buy and sell, there's an exchange. But everything we own is Allah's too. So the selling doesn't make any sense. He's our owner too. But Allah Azza wa speaks to us in terms we will understand because human beings are greedy. When it comes to business deals, our ears open up. Really, there's a good deal? I can get something out of this? So Allah Azza wa speaks to us in, in the terms we understand. In the terms that, are in, that incentivize things for us. So Allah Azza wa here says, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ Those who spend, when it's easy to spend, and when it's hard to spend. And what is it that they spend? Allah didn't say amwalahum here. He didn't say amwal. He says amwal and, and wealth and assets in other places. In this passage, he, meant, he didn't mention it. It includes wealth, but it includes time. It includes your youth. It includes your energies. It includes your priorities. It includes your planning. You give that up for the sake of Allah. You sacrifice things for the sake of Allah. You've invested things for the sake of Allah. Anfaqa literally means to lose something. To let go of something. So we let go of the things that which we love. And we let, let them go for the sake of Allah to acquire this attribute of taqwa. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ This is the first characteristic. Now listen to the second one. It, maybe you could say, I don't know, I don't have anything to give. I don't have any money. But the next attribute, all of us can manage. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ Allah says those who swallow their anger. Those who swallow anger. And the wording is very very powerful. كَظَمَ is actually to swallow. Now there's one thing, you know when you're chewing food, if I'm chewing food, you could see my cheeks moving. Right? And you could tell that there's something in my mouth. But if I swallow it, then would you know that I've eaten something? No, it disappears. 
By using the words, Al-Kadhi mean al ghaith Allah Azza wa Jal has illustrated that we have to have such a good control over our temper, that when you do come across something that makes you upset, then when you do get into a disagreement with someone entirely obnoxious, as upset as that makes you, not only do you have to be quiet, you can't even show the anger on your face. You have to swallow it as though it's not even there. The imagery is incredible. You have to have this self-control. And this self-control is increasingly difficult, especially for younger people. We're hot-blooded, you know. Somebody says something we don't want to hear, and our face fires up. For those of you that are younger and you play sports, you're playing basketball, somebody fire, you know, fouls you. Or somebody blocks your shot or something, immediately your, your cheeks turn red, you have to exact revenge. Right? How easily we get angry. You're driving your car, somebody cuts you off, and my God, this is the end of the world. Right? Your dignity has all just been, just been uh, compromised. You must cut him now. Right? Well, kaldi mean al This is an attribute of a believer. And the ism fa'il is used. In English, we call it the act of participle. Simply speaking, what that means is they do this all the time. They do it all the time. There are all these opportunities to get angry. Little things, little things at work, little things at the home. Easily the, the wife gets angry at the husband. Very easily the husband gets angry at the wife. Little, little things make you, make you angry at the children. Learn to swallow your anger. Become a person that perseveres through these things. If little things annoy us, if little, little things get angry at us, you know, make us upset, how do we expect Allah Azza wa to forgive our big sins? We expect from Allah that He doesn't get angry at us. And yet here we are exacting anger at every little thing. It shows a lack of restraint. So, وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ And the second, the next attribute, وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ Very difficult. They forgive people out of love. Not غَافِرِينَ Not غَافِرِينَ عَافِينَ غَافِرِ is someone who forgives. But عَاف is someone who forgives out of love. You know when you forgive someone and they offend you and you forgive them? First of all, most people say, Brother, I know that was a nice khutbah and I know I should forgive but my situation is special. You don't understand, this guy was really messed up. He doesn't deserve forgiveness. By the way, you never forgive someone who deserves it. By definition, forgiveness means to give it to somebody who doesn't deserve it. And you're not forgiving for them. You're not exacting forgive. you're not giving them forgiveness because they want it. Or because they deserve it. You're doing it for yourself because you want to be in this list. You want to be among these people that are considered muttaqeen. That's why they forgive people. Especially those who work for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. If you volunteer at a masjid or at an Islamic organization, especially in the situation of family, there's a lot of feuds, there's a lot of things that come up and people get friction among each other. This is where shaitan wants friction. Inna shaitana yanzahu baynakum. Among yourselves, shaitan will no doubt, he will try to cause dissent among you. And these are the times we have to remember وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ You know the Sahaba understood this really beautifully well. Hassan radiallahu anhu was one time, he's sitting there and his servant brings him drink. And when he was pouring the drink, he dropped it. He dropped the drink. Of course this upset the, the Sahabi radiallahu anhu. So immediately he recited this ayah. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ Those who suppress their anger. Those who swallow their anger. Hassan says, Allahu anhu kadam tu ghaydi. I've swallowed my anger. <laughs> he heard the ayah, he said, okay, I'm not upset any, anymore. The servant continues to recite, he says, wala afina anin nas. And they lovingly forgive people. He says, afautuk, I forgave you too. Then he, then he recites the end of the ayah, Allah says, wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. It is Allah who loves those who excel. Who excel in their religion, who excel in their consciousness of Allah. He says, go, you're a free man. He set him free. Because just because he heard the ayah, these ayat are supposed to exact change in our behavior. So here we have three things Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالْضَرَّاءِ Those who spend when it's easy and when it's hard. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ Those who suppress their anger consistently. And then وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ and those who pardon people out of love. And here it implies also out of love of Allah. One thing about forgiving people, because it seems to be a big problem for Muslims. We're very nice to the secretary at work and to the boss. When we come to the masjid, we come with a frown. There's a problem. That brother, yeah, he's nice, may Allah forgive him. And you start with all the flaws he has. We're not forgiving of people, we're very cutthroat when it comes to each other. We have to learn to be different. And in this regard, I share with you just one reminder that I shared with a few students last night. 
Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, probably few of us, there, there can't be any comparison between the love he has for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and anybody else. His love for the Messenger surpasses anybody else's. Radiallahu anhu wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On top of this, his daughter is married to the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So not only does he love him because he is the Messenger of Allah, he loves him because he's family. His daughter is accused. In Surah Nur, we find the incident. His daughter is accused. And his daughter is accused by someone who he used to give some allowance to. Now those of you that have daughters, imagine your daughter is accused in an ugly way, like our mother was accused, Ummul Mu'mineen. Just imagine the rage you would feel, the anger you would have. And on top of this ad that this is not just anybody's daughter, this is not just any woman, this is the mother of the believers. So accusing her is an attack not just on her, but on her husband and on the deen of Islam. It's an attack on the dignity of Islam altogether. This incredible violation, this enormous, enormous, you know, attack. And here we find Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, as how big this man's heart is, he exacts his anger by discontinuing the allowance. That's all he does. He discontinues giving allowance. And Allah Azza wa Jal set such a high standard, move up inshaAllah ta'ala as much as you can. Allah sets such a high standard for him. He tells him, He gives him advice in the Quran. Then he should forgive out of love. They should forgive out of love. They should turn the page. Wouldn't you love that Allah would forgive you? Now listen to this carefully. On the one hand, imagine this scale, okay? There's a scale. On the one hand, there's the anger of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu against this man. It's fair. He, sh- he deserves to be, you know, punished. But on the other hand, Allah gives him either your anger weighs more or your love of being forgiven by Allah weighs more. I'll give you the choice. So when you get, the next time you get upset, you and I get upset, remind ourselves. Is the offense that you that has made you upset, does it compare to the anger and the situation of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu? Does it compare? And does it compare that if you forgive out of love of Allah, and out of, in a loving fashion, if you forgive, then what Allah is offering you is your forgiveness. Is your anger and your revenge worth more? Or is the forgiveness of Allah that He's offering you worth more? What is worth more to you? You will forget about whether the person deserves it or not, whether they're a nice guy or not, whether they even acknowledge they did something wrong or not. You don't care. All you care about is Allah is offering you your forgiveness. أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ so This is the next attribute. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ But the one I want to conclude with, and I only have a couple of minutes to do so, is something very peculiar. You would think I'm going to keep going on with a list of good deeds. Good things that these muttaqeen do. The next ayah is about bad deeds. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Those who did something lewd, shameless, vulgar. Whenever they committed an act that was shame and vulgar, in any way, shape or form, فَاحِشَةً Not الْفَاحِشَةً, but فَاحِشَةً Any act of shamelessness. Whether it was stealing something with the eyes, they gazed at something they shouldn't have. يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ He knows the stealing of your gazes. He knows that too. وَمَا تُخْفِ الصُّدُورِ What the chests are hiding. Whether it was a billboard, whether it was a banner, whether it was some Facebook friend you made, whether it was some texting you were doing in the middle of the night, whether it was some inappropriate interaction, whatever it was, whatever shameless thing you did, these people, are, the muttaqeen are being described that they may fall into this trap too. They're not immune. They're human beings. It might happen. And wallahi, it's so much easier to understand now than it was ever before. You can't take a trip. You can't get in your car unless, unless you're exposed to fahsha hundreds of times before you get to work. We're bombarded with it. So we're guilty of this. Whether we like it or not, we're breathing it in. The, fa- the culture of fahsha, we're breathing it in. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Or they wronged themselves in any other way. They didn't wake up for the prayer. They didn't give their zakat. They didn't, you know, give sadaqah. They weren't, they didn't keep family ties. They wronged themselves in any other way. Allah is describing the muttaqeen like this. Why? Because they will make mistakes. 
But then there's something they do after the mistake. And this is the point I want to make and I'm done inshaAllah ta'ala. He says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ They remembered Allah. I want to tell you about a trick of shaitan. When you go late to work, and your boss is angry at you because you're late, and lots of people work at your office, you know what you do? You avoid eye contact and sneak into your cubicle. You don't want to, sit, you don't want to face him. When you, when you have a bad report card, and you go home to your family, you're in 6th, 7th grade, you got a bad report card, you sneak into the house, there's no, Asalaamu Alaikum, I'm home. You sneak in and you kind of go and you pass out, you go to sleep. <laughs> right, what happened in school? Nothing. When you disappoint someone, you avoid contact with them. You avoid, it's natural. In this case, when we do something shameless, when we wrong ourselves, who have we disappointed? Allah Azza wa Jal. We've just disappointed Allah. So naturally, shaitan takes advantage of this. He comes to you and me and he says, you're gonna go pray now, you hypocrite. You do this shameless thing. You do this and that, and now you wanna go attend a class? Now you wanna go do, you know, ibadah? You should be, you know, you know you, you have, you're such a two-faced person. So this person says to themselves, yeah, I shouldn't go pray because I'm two-faced. Shaitan takes advantage. He distances you from Allah. And we're embarrassed to go before Allah Azza wa Jal. But the true muttaq, he does something wrong. He does something wrong. And immediately what does he do? He remembers Allah. Dhakarullah. There's not even fa, no thumma, nothing. Dhakarullah, immediately. فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ Then they asked Allah to forgive for their sins. And the word for sins here, dhunub, comes from dhanab actually, a tale. That which you're not proud of. That, that which humiliates you. Something you did that you're not proud of. And they ask Allah to forgive those embarrassing things that they did. وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Who's gonna forgive sins if not Allah? Who's gonna, who are you gonna go to? Where else you gotta go? Who knows the things that you and I have done wrong except ourselves and Allah? There's way, there's a lot of things in our closet that Allah has not exposed. And only Allah knows and we have to find the time to ask Allah to forgive. This is the, the, the main attribute of people that are described that enter Jannah. أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ The ayat are coming. The sandwich between mentions of Jannah. And the last thing I share with you about this, this, this final passage, I was one time, I was with my family and we were at a mall. And this other mom, her, her child, she was yelling at her child. This mother was yelling at her child. And the, the kid's crying his head off. And she even gave him a little, you know. But you know where the child went? After he even got hit and yelled at? He's still holding on to the mother. He's not letting go. Everywhere else around, there are these ugly, gigantic strangers. He doesn't want to deal with them. Even if she's angry, even if she's disappointed, even if she's upset, his whole world, his whole shelter, his whole protection, where is he gonna go except? His mother. And it made me think, subhanAllah, when you and I sin, when you and I disobey Allah, where are we gonna go? Where else is there to go? Who do we turn to? We don't, we don't have anywhere else to turn. So even if we disappoint our Lord, even if we fall short of the standards He set for us, the true muttaq, the hopeful of Jannah, He never loses hope in Allah. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله. تقنطوا من رحمة الله. Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Don't, you're not allowed to lose hope in the mercy of Allah. This is the attitude we have to internalize. May Allah Azza wa make us from among the muttaqeen. May Allah make us from those who spend when it's easy and it's difficult. May Allah make us from those who suppress their anger. May Allah make us from those who forgive people lovingly and pardon them, pardon them out of love of Allah Azza wa May Allah make us of those who whenever they commit an act that is not, not becoming of a believer, they immediately remember Allah and they ask Allah to forgive their sins. For who is there to forgive the sins except Allah? May Allah Azza wa protect all of us and our families, especially our youth that are faced with all kinds of trials and tribulations. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salam ala ibadihi alladhi nastafa. Khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin. Muhammadin al-ameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم 
وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا